Hi everybody, uh, this is a review for your midterm exam. Um, it's going to be a video where I will be showing you my screen and going through stuff that I think you need to know. It's the first time I do that kind of a video for a review. I hope it's useful to you and I hope that I don't mess up anything here. Um, anyways, so you probably know that your midterm is on Thursday, this Thursday. Uh, you should know that there is no multiple um, multiple choice questions, so you do not need to bring a Scantron form. Uh, you also do not need to bring a blue book because all the short and longer essay questions will be answered on the exam. Okay, space will, will be provided for you to answer the questions. So all you really need to do, to bring is a pen or pencil. Um, it, it, it will be on Thursday at 3.30, so same room, same place. And you also should know that this is the first part of a midterm exam, and it covers really only what we have um, covered so far, and it's all under objective one. Now, there is a class still on, on Tuesday before your exam, and Professor Whiteley will be talking about things in that class that will be on the exam. So I might mention here some things that we have not talked about yet, but that Professor Whiteley will be talking about on Tuesday. So when you go to class on Tuesday, just make sure that you pay attention um, at those things as well. Um, what I will be doing is that I will start here with uh, the midterm study guide, okay, that is under objective one all the way down here. And then I'll be moving back and forth between what is on the study guide and then the links that are under objective one so that I can show you where you find answers to the questions on the study guide and then I might also refer to some other documents especially under weekly clickers which are the powerpoints Professor Whiteley shows in class where we do the clicker questions and then I will also point you to another file here this one I made term review by Nora um, to help you answer some of the questions. So let's just start with the midterm study guide first and you will understand what I'm talking about. Okay, so when you click there you get to this page here and you see that the study guide is divided into three parts. Part one is about the civil action case which is the one we discussed in our mock trials. So you should be very familiar with uh, this case and you should be, you should, it should be really easy for you to answer the, po the two possible questions here. Um, but then part two is about similar things. So we looked at other cases very similar to the civil action case, case but a lot more recent. And we'll, uh, Professor Whiteley has shown different videos about those. We'll talk about them. That's part two. And then part three um, also discuss some of the same cases as in part two, but it has a different focus. So the type of questions here uh, are different, okay? We'll go uh, one by one. So I will start with part, part one of this midterm study guide is on civil action. There are two possible questions here. Professor Whiteley has talked about them in class before. And they are right here. The first uh, possible question is, did the truth come out of the trial? compare your answer to Judge Skinner's answer, okay, as presented in class. So here, you need to first have an opinion, okay, do you think the truth came out of the trial, but it needs to be an informed opinion, so it needs to show that you know the case, it needs to show that uh, you understood it and you thought about it and you have an opinion on whether or not the truth came out of the trial. But then you also need to know Judge Skinner's answer, as he gave uh, in different videos we saw in class, and then you need to be able to compare your answer to his. How is it different? How is it similar? Okay, do you agree with him? Do you disagree with him? Now, you might not remember all the answers that were given by different people in this trial, and you might not remember Judge Skinner's answer, so I'm going to show you where you find the answer to those questions. I'll go back to the home page. I'll go down on Objective 1. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, sorry. It's actually on top here. I'm going to this midterm review by Nora. Now let me say that there are other files here where the weekly clicker and other links I could point you to where you would find the answer to the truth uh, given by Judge Skinner and by other people. I'm pointing you to this one here, the midterm review by Nora, because I think it's the easiest one 
um, it's the most straightforward um, presentation of this uh, answers okay now this is a review that as you can see here was created in 2010 so it includes a lot of stuff that you do not need it talks about stuff that oops I'm sorry stuff like those things here that will not be on this exam so don't worry about anything only about the first few slides that really talk about the sorry civil action case okay so the first two slides talk about a different question we'll go back to this in a moment let's just look for the question on the truth and this um, is presented on slides four and five so slide four has the question up here did the truth come out of the trial and then it gives you some of the answers that different actors in this case gave okay now this is helpful to you you might not be at you you probably won't be asked you know what did Jen Schlittman said or what the family said but knowing those answers might help you to uh, answer your own um, opinion on whether the truth came out of the trial so you might say something similar to what they said or you might say that you agree with them or things like that uh, now the, the answer given by Judge Skinner that's the one you really need to remember he said when asked about the truth he said right here truth I can't possibly hope to know the truth I have two sides presenting exactly the opposite versions of the truth and justice as far as I'm concerned that's in the eye of the beholder I do not want to talk about that stuff the business of civil action cases is to resolve disputes obviously you don't need to know word by word what he's saying you don't need to memorize this but you do need to understand the es essence of his answer so what you see here is that basically what he's saying is that you know I was not trying to find the truth the civil action the trial is not a place for truth finding it's a place to resolve disputes that's what we do so really he's not concerned about the truth he didn't really answer if it came out of the trial because to think to him this is really irrelevant that's not the point of the trial and if you remember this uh, similar answer was given by by other people especially the attorneys for the defense when they talked about the difference between a case and a cause and when they talked about the, um, the fact that the trial has certain rules that you need to obey and that some things are allowed, some things are not. Um, all those were really making a reference to the fact that the trial is a process of resolving a dispute. It's not necessarily a process where the truth will be revealed. So this is one possible answer, right? One way of seeing uh, this, this whole thing and what happened in Wilbur. Um Judge Skinner's answer actually does have a second part because he, then he's asked does it trouble you that the EPA conclusion later on after the trial was different than what happened at the trial and he says no for reasons I just said they were dealing with different evidences I don't know but certainly in a different way so for him is all about the evidence and how it's presented okay and it may not you know it's kind of, it's implicit here reveal the truth okay so you might agree with this and you might say in your own answer that that's what you think or you might think differently you might think that um, something more in line with what the families thought that they never got to testify so the truth was never revealed um, you might say something about what um, their the plaintiff's attorney um, said and then you have to say how this is different from from Judge Skinner okay so this should not be too difficult I'm going to go back here to the midterm study guide to show you the other possible question on the civil action case and that is the one talking about difficulties of plaintiffs versus the two different defendants Grace and Beatrice okay so do they present the same difficulties so here again you go back to the PowerPoint I was just just showing you which is called midterm review by Nora and now we go back to the first two slides so slides two and three have those uh, difficult to really explain in a nice way for you. So here the first one talking about how the plaintiffs, uh, what kind of trouble they went through in this trial. So you might remember from the videos we saw, you might remember from Death and Justice, uh, there was an internal fight fight between the lawyers whether or not to take this case, this case. Um, as it was explained, a civil action case. In a civil action case, the, uh, the lawyers really um, only make money if they win 
they come, the, 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 their clients, the families, the plaintiffs, they do not pay them anything, right? So they have to be very careful uh, about what kind of cases they're going to take. So they, there was a fight. The lawyers didn't really agree whether or not this was a good case for them. Then the second problem they had was that the defense proposed or suggested to the, to the um, judge, Judge Skinner, and he um, accepted the suggestion, which was to bifurcate the case. So this is what the schedule of the trial here is talking about. And in this case, the first phase of the trial was really technical, was really just about what happened to the chemicals and the water and the soil and all that kind of stuff. It had nothing to do really with the stories of the families and the families didn't get to testify. And because the trial never passed uh, that first phase, the families really didn't have a chance to speak, to talk about their stories. So this didn't help the plaintiffs. Then you had the problem with costs. So as I explained earlier, the money always um, is up front by the lawyers. And, uh, and this was a problem because this case was very costly. It was a very long case. It was a very complicated case. And then, um, related to this was the fact that there was a lot of research that didn't exist at that time. So we didn't really know if TCE and PCU caused leukemia. Um, there was no uh, theory explaining exactly how the water was moving underground and all that kind of research had to be done so that the plaintiffs could have a case here, right? And they didn't have a lot of money. The lawyers were paying for all this. Now the defense did. The defense had deep pockets, right? And then we had the problem with the expert witnesses. Um, so here uh, the plaintiffs had a problem with your hydrologist couldn't prove uh, his water flow uh, river theory, right? So that the, he didn't explain in a, in a way that would help the plaintiffs how the water moved underground. And then they also had an issue that the city of Walburn had an industrial past. It was polluted. It was known for industries polluting the environment for a long, long time. So this doesn't help the plaintiffs because the defense might use that as an argument to say, we didn't do it. There were other companies here way before us and they were also contaminated and so on and so forth. So didn't this fact didn't help the plaintiffs. Now the defense, there were two defendants, Beatrice and Grace, they had one similar difficulty which was that they had a case that was very strong against them because it involves the death of children, right? So the first thing they they had to do, they tried to do and they did succeed was to find a way to prevent the families from testifying. And when Judge Skinner accepted the suggestion to bifurcate the case and make the very first phase a technical one, they accomplished what they wanted, which was to prevent the families from speaking because they thought it was going to be too strong for the jury and would make judgment really difficult and very difficult for them to make an argument for the companies. But then they had different difficulties as well. Beatrice... Um, had someone admitting that they knew the chemicals, so that kind of suggested they were um, using the chemicals because they knew uh, what they were. They also had a problem with their expert witness, again, the hydrologist, who focused on the surface water instead of the underground water. Then Grace had former employees that talked about the, the disposal of the chemicals on the ground, so obviously that doesn't help, uh, doesn't help Grace. And then you had the fact that Grace was on the same side of the river as the two wells, and it was much closer to the wells as Beatrice. So Beatrice could use the argument that it was farther away, it would take long for the water to get to the wells, there was a river in between and all that, but Grace didn't have all that. So for, for Grace, the case was more difficult. So now you know, here is where you find the answers to difficulties. I'm going to close this because we don't need anything else from this PowerPoint. And that's it. We're done with part one, the civil action case. I'm moving to part two, and here I'm not going to follow the order that is on this study guide, okay? And I'll explain why. Uh, the reason is that story of stuff we did not talk about yet. Professor Whiteley will talk about it, about it on Tuesday. So I'm going to go back to it after I cover the material that we already talked about, okay? This first part here is just explaining to you the context of everything that we are discussing in their objective one. The fact that toxic chemical uh, exposure is a very um, 
important question for us to address. It's an, it's an important issue for society today. It has been for a long time, and we're seeing that we're not really dealing with this uh, very well, right? And obviously, this is uh, I don't I don't think is on the exam, but you know it doesn't cost too much to just reflect about based on what we we are seeing here. Why is so difficult for us to deal with toxic chemicals to prevent them to to contain them? Okay, why is this a problem that we we have a hard time solving? So let me move on to the stuff that we already discussed, the cases that we discussed, which are similar to the civil action case but more recent. And they are starting here with this master sergeant's daughter. Just a note before I go on to that. Very important. These two topics here are not going to be on the exam. Okay, we did not talk about them. Professor White, we will not talk about them. And they're not on the exam. Okay, so just forget about those. And let's look at what we have seen already. So, Master Sergeant's daughter, uh, you need to remember, is a case very similar to the civil action case that involves the death of a child uh, from leukemia, contracted by what her father would understand later on was contaminated water where they lived. So, he was a Marine, they lived in uh, Camp Lejeune, and, you know, his daughter got um, sick, she died of leukemia, and years later, um, he found out that the water was had been contaminated uh, by chemicals used in a dry cleaner business, that the Marines actually knew about this um, and didn't really do much to, to, to prevent that or to solve the problem. Other people were injured, other people had suffered um, health issues. And so this case is very, very similar to the civil action case. When you look at it, um, when you when you think about this case, you need to, to remember what killed this little girl and, you know, you know, it's leukemia, but there is, you know, what killed also is the contaminated water, is also negligence from the Marines and all that kind of stuff. So you, you, you think about it when you answer this question, why did her early death occur? So, you know, it didn't have to happen, right? It was a not, not natural cause. So think about how you would answer this one here as well. Now, if you don't remember the case, or if you obviously want to, to, to remember some of the details so you answered this correctly, and, and this is all what we're looking for here is all informed answers. Um, if you want to look for more information on the case, I'll show you where to find. So you go back to the home page, and you go down here to Objective 1, and there is a link on Master Sergeant's daughter, okay? And here you find the videos that we saw in class and you find a good summary of the case, okay, with the most important information that will help you make an informed answer to the questions asked. I'm going back to the study guide. And I'll move on to the next one. So we talked about this master sergeant's daughter. Now we're going to move to traffic bureau. In this case, we talked about the class before the mock trial week. So we talked about this case of a, a company, a rich company, a European company that um, disposed of toxic chemical um, in Ivory Coast and by doing so contaminated communities and caused a lot of health issues including the death of children. This case was reported by the British Broadcasting Company, BBC, and that's what we saw in class. We saw a report from them. Um, actually, BBC later on had to apologize to Trafigura because uh, under British law, you, they couldn't really have broadcasted a story if they didn't have proof that Trafigura had contaminated um, the community and had been responsible for the health issues and the deaths. So here you need to, to remember, uh, you need to know what happened, so what the, what the penalty was, and then why was such a nothing penalty because it is a 73 billion dollar company then you need to remember uh, what kind of lessons we learned from this case okay I really don't think that this will be on the exam I don't remember what this is but let's look at the information more information on the trafficker case okay you go back again to the home page and you go to objective one and you go to trafficker study guide right here Okay, when you click there, you have all the information about the case, a summary of what happened, you know, the company of 73 billion um, annual revenue, net profit of 404 million, um, what they did here uh, with um, 
you know, the toxic waste they had and that they went to uh, the Ivory Coast and dumped this unsafely and caused a lot of problems to the population there. Then you have here what happened in the in the trials and the fine the fine that they received, which is uh, written somewhere here, I think is 1.3 million. Mm, let me see. Uh, okay, I cannot see it here. Well, anyways, whenever you read this, you're going to find that information, and I believe it was a 1.3 fine they had to pay, which is really nothing, given that they have a 73 billion annual revenue. Now, once you look at this, you're going to remember the case, you're going to uh, have a lot of information about the case. Now, let me show you something else that will help you answer the questions asked. If you go back to the um, home page and you actually go up to the weekly clicker there is one weekly clicker on the Trafigura case this one here when you go there you open the PowerPoint and again you have some information about the case about the waste about the dumping and then about BBC the British Broadcasting Company what they did and how they had to apologize for broadcasting this story the censoring in the United United Kingdom, that's why they had to apologize. And then their response, oh, there it is, the, um, the criminal fine of 1.3 million, that's what they were, uh, that was the penalty for Trafigura. And then here, uh, the last slide, that's what I wanted to show you, is really the, the lessons we learned from the Trafigura case. So international law is weak. Rich corporations can use their power and influence to coerce, and that's what they did with BBC. It is cheaper to dump toxic waste than it is to dispose of it safely, and that is why Trafigura chose to bring it to Ivory Coast instead of disposing of it safely in Europe or anywhere else, but it would cost them more money. And then D, Trafigura, if, if Trafigura had not been stopped at the European Union, uh, they would never be sanctioned. They would just continue to do what they, what they were doing. So I hope this helps you to answer. I'm going back to the midterm study guide the questions that are asked on the Trafigura case, right here. Okay, so now we move to another case here, another topic we discussed, and I'll talk about those two things together, they belong together, the precaution, precautionary principle and Blumberg's myths and realities. So the question here is, what is the precautionary principle? And then the other question is for you to identify the myths and realities presented by Professor Blumberg. So let me go back to the homepage, under objective one, you will find uh, Professor Blumberg's myths and realities right here. We, look, we looked at this in class, so it's just this one slide that opens up here. And this is really myths and realities on um, uh, indoctrine disruptive chemicals, okay? What you have on the left side are the myths. So those are the things that we like to believe are happening. And then on the right side, you have the things that are actually happening. So here you have um, what we like to believe, which is that we have a government and there is an agency called the Environmental Protection Agency that is basically taking care of us. So we like to believe that if we go to the grocery store and you buy some food or we buy cleaning products or we buy cosmetics or whatever we buy, that they are safe. Otherwise, they wouldn't be there for us to buy, right? Well, that's what we like to believe, but as we see here, that's not necessarily true because, first of all, um, those chemicals are not regulated until they're proven they're not safe. So this is what the precautionary principle is about, and this is really important for you to, to know. The idea that the precautionary principle would be being uh, better being safe than sorry when you regulate chemicals, right? So better regulating everything until we know that they're safe, and then we allow them to be used in products, right? And for people to be exposed to them. That's not what we do, right? The reality is that we don't regulate them. Actually, those chemicals that might be really harmful, we don't know, are out there being used, we're exposed to them, we have access to them, and they're only going to be regulated once we know for sure that they're not safe for us. So 
I don't know about you, but I feel like this is kind of a weird way of dealing with this because, you know, once we really know with science that they're not good for us, it might be too late, right? They might have caused lots of damage to lots of people. But by not using the precautionary principle, we are simply saying, you know, we're not going to do anything about this until we know that it's not good for us. Instead of saying, you know what, you cannot use this product, we're not going to allow it to be on the market, uh, people cannot be exposed to this because we don't know what they do to us. That would be the precautionary principle, but we're not using it, okay? Other countries use that use precautionary principle. They have much stronger regulation on chemicals. That's not the case of the United States. Another uh, myth here is that the EPA, so this you know government, this agency, is uh, is conducting exposure assessments, so they know how we are really exposed, in real life, exposed to chemicals. That's not true. Actually, our notion of what kind of um, exposure we, we, we have is really based on models. So that's not like real life exposure. It's based on models that may be true, may not be true, may be accurate, may not be accurate. Um, another myth here is that this agency is using state-of-the-art science to evaluate if the chemicals are safe or not. Okay. Actually, I, I think I mentioned the first one, but let me just go back to the first one here, is the, the myth that the agency is actually testing those chemicals and they know the effect they have on our body. So all of these are myths. The reality is that the Environmental Protection Agency does not test anything. They only require manufacturers themselves to test basic tests on, on the toxicity, toxic, toxicity of, of those chemicals, right? So we rely on their tests Hopefully they're accurate, hope they're doing them, hope they're not cheating, because that's all the, the test that is done on chemicals that we're exposed to. Then uh, the one I really explained more is the reality that we're not using the precautionary principle, so the chemical is, is, is licensed, is free to be used, until we prove that they're not safe, or until we know they're not safe. Then exposure assessments are based on modeling, I talked about this, and the case that we think um, the agency is using state-of-the-art science, um, but it's not the true. The truth. The truth is that um, you know funding and infrastructure and laboratory science uh, used by EPA is is not state-of-the-art. So I I mentioned this in one of my learning communities. The crazy thing is that we we do not know the effects of those chemicals in our body. We know the effects of very few chemicals that we're exposed to. We know some effects. Now we have no idea what happens when lots of chemicals are interacting all together in our bodies. So this is kind of a crazy thing. Now, uh, you need to remember what the myths are, you need to remember what the reality is, you need to remember what the precautionary principle is, this is really important, and we're going to go back to the precautionary principle when we do part three of the midterm study guide. Now I'm going to go back to the midterm study guide and go back where we were and I'll continue down here those things before going to part three where we're going to actually talk about the precautionary principle again. So workplace exposure, we saw this in class, we saw this movie, this video of Sherry Farley, uh, you know, a young woman, I think she was in her 40s, who walked with a lump and she had a lot of health problems because she was working on this um, uh, manufacturing company, um, you know, gluing furniture and the glue was very toxic and even, you know, short-term exposure to the chemicals in that glue uh, were harmful to her. So now she has, you know, the problem she has forever really. And this was really important negligence because the the company had been warned about the toxic, toxicity of these chemicals. They were um, um, they were advised to to open windows to to improve ventilation and they didn't really do any of those. So here we show a problem where this woman was just going to work really and got really really ill because of malpractice, uh, because of negligence, because of you know the, the exposure she had in her workplace. Then we saw another case of workplace exposure and that was the case of then Ross. We saw uh, this report uh, titled Trade Secrets. 
And here it's important that you remember this story. You remember that it was the wife of Dan Ross that was telling the story. He actually died um, because of the illness he had, which he contracted by being exposed to chemicals in the place he worked. And the wife suspected, they, they both suspected when he got ill that it had something to do with the chemicals. But it was only when they found, when she found uh, a paper that Dan Ross had received from his job years earlier um, that was marked uh, confidential. That's, that's the only uh, point in time when she kind of realized that they actually had to sue their, the, their, the Dan's employer in order to get to the truth of what happened because she realized that they actually knew that Dan was being exposed to levels of uh, toxic chemicals that he should not have been. That's why the document was secret. Um, so the legacy here was that through this lawsuit, we saw in the video the images of these rooms full of um, files and, and documents and a whole history of the plastic revolution in this country uh, which shows that uh, companies were aware of possible damage and were being secretive about them. So they were not revealing, they were um, issuing documents and reports about toxicity, toxicity. I need to learn how to pronounce this word, I'm sorry, but you know what I mean. Um, so they were really discovering that the companies knew about those things and were just being um, keeping them a secret within the company, damaging um, the health of their employees. So the legacy was the uncovering of all that information, right? That that led to some regulation uh, on on workplace place exposure. Now, the last case here under part two. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Let me just show you that there is some more information about those cases under objective one. If you don't remember, I just give you a, a summary of the stories. But if you don't remember, you go back to objective one, and here you find some links like this one here workplace, um, ex chemical exposure in the workplace. Uh, here we have a story from New York Times that talk about, um, about uh, it's a video we saw in class, Sheriff Farley in her problem, okay? And then you obviously have more information as well if you go to the weekly clicker that deals with that topic. So other weekly clicker here, you can look for the one that talks about chemical exposure in the workplace. So you will have some information as well, additional information here about the cases we saw in class. Sherry Farley, and then later on you'll see uh, Dan Ross and things like that, okay? Now let me go back to the study guide and move on to the last case on part two, which is something we did not talk about yet. So I'm guessing it's going to be discussed on Tuesday, so pay attention here, but is the case of a bee, bee colony collapse so you'll see is a disorder that has killed lots of bees. Um, the question is why it is happening. Um, obviously, the importance of asking this is that uh, bees are really, really important to us. So there is uh, there are lots of foods that we would not have if we did not have bees. So bees are important to us. We care about them. We should care about them. But they are dying, so this is uh, something we're concerned about as a society, we should be concerned about. And the question is, why is this happening? And you will see in the video that it's really difficult to find causation, because there are lots of uh, possibilities here. Uh, it's very difficult to scientifically prove where the problem is coming from, but there is a high suspicion that it comes from uh, a, type, a new type of pesticide that has been introduced, and that is killing the bees. Now, if there is a suspicion that we have a pesticide causing this problem, the precautionary principle would say, well, let's stop using this until we know it's not the cause, until we know it's safe. That would be the precautionary principle. That's not what we do, right? So the question is, would you apply the precautionary principle? Why would you do so? Why would that help? Okay? Again, remember that it's hard to understand the cause of this problem, the bee colony collapse. So the precautionary principle, the idea here is that well, at least until we know what the cause is, we are avoiding one of the possible causes, right? So pay attention in the videos in class and what Professor Whiteley is going to talk about and try to formulate an answer to this question.
Again, there is information on that case, the bee colony collapse here on the web page under Objective 1. So there is some information here, but most of it will be discussed, all of it will be discussed in class. Okay. Back to the study guide, now to part 3. So here we have uh, some cases that were similar to the ones we discussed on part 2 some that are uh, new on this part of the, of, of the study guide, but the question to those are really referring to the precautionary principle. principle. So basically, um, here it's asking you to demonstrate your understanding uh, of these cases of the human exposure to chemicals, and then whether changing the reality, you know, changing the myths, and making them a reality, the ones we saw from Professor Blumberg, and implementing the precautionary principle would have changed the nature of these cases. So you need to know the case, and you need to know the myths and realities, and you need to know the precautionary principle. So here, for example, you will see on Tuesday, we did, talk, we did not talk about this yet, but you will see on Tuesday as well, this little death by rubber duck, which is a book um, that discusses our exposure to chemicals in our daily life very, very damaging kinds of chemicals that we're exposed to at all times. When we eat, when we play, when we um, sleep, when we take a shower, uh, when we shop for uh, cleaning products, a lot of the things that we have in our homes right now, in a lot of the places we go to, um, in a lot of uh, situations, we're exposed to those chemicals, right? Um, so this is obviously making us very vulnerable to those chemicals, right? They're everywhere and they're not regulated because we do not apply the precautionary principle. So the question is, would the precautionary principle lead to a healthier society? In this case, in the case of the chemicals that we're exposed to in our daily uh, lives. The second uh, case, the bee colony disorder, we just saw it on top here, on part two. Uh, why is causation so difficult? I just talked about this. And then what actions should be taken by regulators? Um, yeah, I hope that this is obvious to you. Causation is very difficult. What should we do? Um, then we have chemical exposure in the workplace. So the same case as we saw here, up here in part two. Um, the question is, uh, why have the warnings given by given to the companies been ignored? Why is the use of those chemicals, why has it increased? And then why should the level of, gov what should be the level of government regulation? So what should the government do about those things? Okay, again, if you go back and read some of the details about this story, if you think about the myths and realities, the precautionary principle, you should be able to answer this question pretty easily. Then, uh, this case has not been discussed yet. Again, I believe it will be on Tuesday. It's the case in Hawaii of a farm that residents believe are blowing dust, uh, pesticide dust, uh, into their communities and causing problems, health risks, okay? So, where sh what should the neighborhood do? In this case, you're going to see they filed a lawsuit. Um, why are the chemicals... Um, no, why did the chemical industry authorize their attorneys to file such a significant lawsuit? So you will see in the in the case discussed in class, you you have information about the lawsuit. I can tell you that it's also here as well. You see, I believe the same video Professor Wifley will show in class is here. So anything that talks about the past, the test past aside the farm, uh, that talks about Hawaii, um, I believe those next two here are all about this case okay one of them is the actual video this one here is the actual video you're gonna see in class okay going back oops going back here to the midterm study guide and then this, the last one is death by school lunch we saw this is the case of the children school children that died after having uh, lunch which was contaminated um, in their schools uh, this was in India, in a poor community. You had a problem with the director, school director, uh, 
I think the cook uh, used a pot that had been contaminated by pesticides that was used to store pesticide to cook this children meal. Uh, children got sick. They had hours of uh, road trip to the ho first hospital, so they did not survive. So here you have a lot of different things combining, a lot of different problems combining to make this strategy tra tragedy. You have the um, negligence of in, in criminal negligence of the school itself. You have also poverty. You have lack of infrastructure to serve these children um, near their homes. They had to travel a long distance to the hospital and so on. So remember, um, remember this case. I'm not sure exactly the question that would be asked, but it's along the lines of, you know, the 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 lack of maybe oversight, the lack of responsibility, the the problem with poverty and lack of, of infrastructure. So it should not be too difficult if you remember and you learn and you understand the case. I do believe there is information again on their objective one about yeah death by lunch. So there is a PowerPoint as well that will help you remember the case. There is a summary of what happened. Okay. Okay, and then we have uh, something important. Because here we reach the end of the midterm study guide, but it's not the end of the exam. There are two new topics that are not here on the study guide, so very important. Two things that are not here, but they might be on the exam. And they're not here because they are pretty recent. They were added to the class this quarter. Those are the things we first discussed in the very beginning of the quarter. The Exide battery plant, uh, which are here, and so it's here, some more information. This is happening right here in LA. Uh, this is really important to us because it's contamination uh, of the soil that has caused several uh, health issues. The plant now is closed, uh, but children have been tested and have uh, it has been found that they have high levels of lead in their bloods, which cause all kinds of de development problems. And it's a similar case to the case in Flint, Michigan, which we also saw in the beginning of the class. Again, in that case, is the water that is contaminated, but again, the children have suffered from contamination and they have found very high levels of lead, lead poisoning, um, high levels of lead in, the, in this children's um, blood. So this is really affecting, you know, the small creatures in our community, causing lots of health issues. Those are, uh, for the most part, especially in Flint, poor communities, there is a, a, a problem with negligence from the government itself, to take care and regulate and uh, and make sure that these things don't happen, right? So please remember those two cases. Please read again if you don't remember. I think I don't... Oh, here you have Flint water crisis on their objective two. I'm not sure why it's here. Maybe it's just... I do believe this is a mistake. It should be under objective one because it might be on the exam. It has been covered in class. I'm almost sure that there is a weekly clicker about this as well. Let's see. Flint water crisis. So yes, we talked about this. It's here. It might be on the exam as well. And you need to remember what kind of problems lead poisoning, especially these children, uh, suffered. You need to remember, remember what happened and why it happened, okay? So this is the end of this study guide. Let me see if there is anything else I did not discuss that you should know. Um, I do not think so. Just remember that uh, the questions are essay questions. They're um, open-ended questions. Some of them I feel like we're asking your opinion, and we are, except that it's an opinion based on what you learned. So you always have in your answers to show us that you know what you're talking about, that you study that you were in class that you know the cases so yes give your opinion when we ask for it but also mention the case or base your opinion on something that we discussed in class so that we know that it's uh, an informed answer that it means that you know you know what happened in class okay um, i hope this is helpful if you have questions you can always email me you can email your tas uh, professor whiteley has office hours there is no learning community this week Please remember this, no learning community on Tuesday, no learning communities, discussion sessions, whatever, on Wednesday, no on, no, no on, two, on Thursday after the, mid, the midterm. Um, 
I know the other two TAs uh, have off hours this week. I do not have. I'm out of, out of the country. But if you have questions and you want to talk to me about them, just uh, send me an email. I have access to my email. Otherwise, you can see Professor Whiteley or the other two TAs during their office hours. And that's the end. I hope this was helpful and good luck on your exam. I'll see you on week five. Bye-bye.